Welcome to the Center for Creative Leadership's webinar, How to Foster Flexible Leadership in Times of Instability. It will be presented today by Alan Calarco of the Center for Creative Leadership, also known as CCL. My name is Tracy Dobbins, and I'll serve as your CCL webinar moderator for today's session. At the Center for Creative Leadership, our sole focus is leadership development, education, and research. We are excited to share the benefits of flexible leadership and how you can foster it in your organization to stay agile and competitive. We are pleased to have Alan Calarco, the Center for Creative Leadership, with us today. Alan has been associated for CCL for over 20 years and currently serves as a senior faculty member and executive coach, where he provides program design, team and group facilitation, and executive coaching. As a certified CCL coach, Alan um, brings a practical approach to work, helping individuals translate theories into application. Welcome, Alan. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as Tracy indicated, my name is Alan. I also go by Al. I'm a faculty member here. There's a photo of me, and the only thing that would be different with this photo now is I, like most of you, probably have hair that's a little longer than it is in this photograph. But I'm happy to be with all of you. We have a large group today and uh, a lot to go through. And what I want to do is I want to particularly welcome some friends and colleagues who I know are online, as well as some neighbors who I know are dealing with transition and change in their life right now, and uh, some of my clients that I'm working with as well. So it's great to hear from all of you and have you with us so that we can talk about this important topic. I tried to think of a way to kick off the WebEx by looking up some uh, headlines from previous situations in the United States that would equal what's going on right now with change and, and the pandemic, but I, I just couldn't find anything that I thought really represented what we're all living through and going through. And I heard in the drive early this morning that um, over 5 million more people have applied for unemployment benefits, you know, raising that number now closer to 30 million people. So one thing that is constant today is change. And that we know from frequency, leaders constantly have to deal with it, manage it, and lead it. Unfortunately, most people tell us today that they feel like they're overmanaged and underled. It's also personalization. Leaders must understand it and pers personally before helping others. The analogy I like to use here is that leaders need to put their mask on first before they attempt to help anyone else with their mask and uh, thinking of airlines as well as the, the symbolism of masks today, and then role modeling. People are going to look to and rely on leadership and leaders and organizations in times of change and instability. And that the last bit about success is that flexibility is important for leaders' effectiveness and success and is especially important during these times of change. So here's where we're going. There are varying degrees of change. There are plan changes, and the example here is an organizational structure. And then there's unprecedented crisis, much like we're dealing with now. And then and you can imagine everything, everything in possibly in between. Now, a couple of things before we go forward. One is we have to remember that we, we individually judge ourselves by our intentions. But everybody who works with us or everybody lives with us or everybody who loves us um, manage, deals with us through our behaviors. And so we're working on our intentions and our intentions to be good and productive leaders while everyone else is judging us by the behaviors that we demonstrate. And what I'm going to try to do today is talk to you about behaviors that are demonstrated when people are showing flexibility and, and agility and adaptability. And I'm not going to judge people's intentions uh, or talk much about your intentions. So it's a little bit of everything in between. Now, remember, everything that I'm going to be talking about today is being recorded, and you'll have access to the recording of that information as well as access to all of the slides that I'm going to share with you. In the beginning, I'm going to go through the slides rather quickly and then get to the meat of the presentation and then certainly leave time uh, at the very end for you to uh, ask any questions that you might have. I'm uh, thrilled that we're a very international group. I've seen Nairobi. I've seen Bahrain. I've seen Pakistan. I've seen Hawaii, I've seen Japan. Uh, so we literally are an international group here today talking about change. And again, the varying degrees of change, everything from something that's planned to unprecedented crisis. Now here's where we're going to go. I want you to use the chat box for a second. 
And I want you to say to me, do you think change is the same thing as transition? And let's get some words there. You could put yes, no, maybe, I don't know. Do you think they're the same thing? Boy, I see, na I see no's coming from all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> well done. Yep, transition can help you go through change. Transition happens over time. <clears throat> the change seems bigger than the transition. Nice perspective. Great. Change is constant. Transition is finite, right? So let's talk a little bit about change and transition. And the example I want to use is one that uh, that a number of us are currently dealing with. Uh, you're, um, uh, you're told that you suddenly have to work remotely. You have to work from home. And so the change is that you no longer are in your office or no longer in your physical structure. And I know for some of you who are currently working from home, from home that's a pretty easy adjustment. For, but for the folks, those of us and me included, who worked in an office, the change is the, is the actual fact that you are no longer working in your office. And the transition is this psychological event that I'm indicating right here. Uh, it, what happens to people in their minds as they go through a change? A change is somewhat external. It happens to people, and even if they don't agree with it, it still happens. But the transition is internal, and it's this internal process that gets us in the most challenging, difficult situations. So the change is something happens to you, and the transition is the psychological process you go through when a change occurs. Now, change is situational, like I said, the example of working virtually, uh, or it could be a new organization or a new organizational culture or a new team or new team roles, new policies or procedures, or maybe a new work environment. The change would be that you've moved or relocated. The transition is psychological, which is that process we go through to come to terms with the change. And even change that is positive. You're given a, an opportunity, a new, a new role within the organization, maybe given a promotion, all of those things, maybe a raise. Those things are seen as positive. The truth is there's a psychological process that you go through when the change occurs. You're offered a new role in the organization, and as you ride home or drive home, you start to begin to think about the impact on your family and those people that you love. Now, William Bridges has written about change and transition extensively, and he began to write, write about it in the 1980s and early 90s. And what he began to tell us is that change is understood in terms of a beginning or starting something new. It happens quickly, and it's experienced externally and visibly, changing your organizations, a new marriage, a new home, a loss of a loved one, et cetera. That's the change. But the transition is understood in terms of endings begins with leaving something behind, letting go, etc. It usually takes more time. It's experienced internally and might be invisible to others or hard for them to see. And so for those of you, we're using the example of people who are asked to work remotely. So now you're home and you're experiencing this transition internally and others are not only can't see it in you, they're not working nearby you and are unable to be helpful uh, in the process. And some of you might be managing changes right now and managing the transition process right now. I happen to be working remotely, and uh, when I was driving home the day I learned of that, all of those questions came to my mind about where will I work, is the dining room table okay, will I have privacy, what about phone calls, what about Zoom and Skype and Viltz and Google Docs, and all of those other kinds of things, and I began to worry about what the transition impact would be on me and those around me. So Bridges went on further to state that there are basically three stages of this process. And the first one is this ending, losing, and letting go. Uh, and and it, you're really letting go of what was. And if you think about it, the example, I worked in higher education for 20 years, and I've been thinking about all of the students, even the high school students who are missing out on graduations and commencements, because I think of commencement processes and closing down of academic years as opportunities for something to end and for people to have that natural transition to the next stage or phase. So there's an ending, a losing and a letting go. Then there's a neutral zone. And what this is about, it's about confusion, and people work hard to find um, a clarity among, or um, among this confusion stage. 
And then in the third stage, there's a new beginning, managing the uncertainty of starting something new. And for most of us, this new thing is not about it's not about competence, it's about confidence. And most of us wonder, can we really do the new thing that they're asking us to do? And I'll give you an example for myself. I certainly have known of Skype and I have known of Zoom and have been a participant in Zoom calls before, but suddenly now being asked to lead Zoom activities and vilts through the Zoom process um, it brings a whole nother level of anxiety because it's a new beginning. And I like to think of myself, I was on a Zoom call the other day and one of the participants said, it's like we're the Wright brothers with wings on our backs and riding a bicycle trying to get it to take off from the ground. And that's where we are. We're all kind of trying to figure this new thing out and managing in this uncertainty in starting something new. And some of us will approach that from a very positive opportunity perspective, and some of us, quite frankly, might see it as paralyzing and very, very difficult um, to let go. I do see a question about how do you relate when someone says we're going through a period of change, and all we're saying is that period of change is probably somewhere between here, ending, losing, letting go, and then this neutral zone. And that's why um, uh, when a change process occurs, most organizations are so uncomfortable with this chaotic feeling of letting things go and this confusion in the middle, they sometimes go back to doing it the way they've always done it and uh, fall back on other processes that didn't work in the past, and maybe they'll just try them in a new way. But again, three stages, letting go, losing, a neutral zone, and then a new beginning, and a new beginning is really about opportunities. So flexible leadership, here's some, ch some tips when I coach people, uh, and they talk to me about change going on in the organization. I ask them a few questions. Um, do they see the change as positive? Are there opportunities? Uh, do they, are they willing or able to adapt their plans? Again, the example of Zoom or Skype, how good are you at managing or mastering new technology, vocabulary, new rules? Do they seek feedback? Do they lead change by example? And I'll talk more about that one in a little while. Oops, sorry. Do they see it as, as an example? A few more. Do they take into account people's concerns during the change? I'll share with you all a little later a research project we did on adaptability, and it talked about uh, when I used the example of people feeling overmanaged and underled. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. It's an opportunity to sort out your strengths and weaknesses uh, fairly accurately, and are you good at that? Uh, do you admit personal mistakes and learn from them and move on? And are you seen as an optimistic person? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about adaptability. What role does uh, optimism play in that? So here's where we're going to go. How can your organization leaders guide you through? Now, it's important here that this word leaders, I'm not only talking about the people at the top end of the food chain in your organization. I believe that everybody leads from where they sit and from where they stand, and they present an opportunity to lead or guide people through each of these stages. So stage one. People fear what they don't understand. And if you think about that statement, uh, you bring clarity to them about in trying to make meaning out of what isn't making meaning for them now. So a couple ways to do that. One is you can define what is and what is not over and be clear about that. Identify what's being lost or changed. Identify the team, what the team might be gaining or could be gaining. Educate them about a positive future. And again, this is about that realistic, optimistic language. And then communicate how, how their knowledge and skills are, essential, are an essential part of getting there, right? And that's about telling people that you see them in the mix and you see them in the opportunity for the future. The starting point for transition is not the outcome, but what you have to leave behind or let go before you make the new beginning. It's not the outcome. It's what do you have to leave go, let go of or leave behind. Nothing so undermines organizational change as the failure to think through who will have to let go of what before the change occurs. And again, this is William Bridges, the person I referred to uh, previously, who wrote extensively about managing change and managing transition. Who will have to let go of what? So stage two, the neutral zone, people feeling lost and need a solid sense of direction. Now remember, Martin Luther King never said, I have a strategic plan. 
Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. And some of this neutral phase and neutral zone are, is the leader and the leadership in the organization talking to you about aspirations of where they want the organization to go. But they should provide consistent, timely feedback, especially regarding any changes. Set some short-term short -term goals. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Prioritize work that's most important to get done now. Uh, make shifts to help team members manage workloads. Don't expect perfection, and in fact, don't in expect it in yourself. Balance complaining with problem solving, and I think that's the optimistic side of this again. And then find hidden opportunities amid any of the confusion. That's the neutral zone. So the neutral zone. It's not so much that we're afraid of change or in love with the old ways, but it's the place in between that we fear. It's like being between trapezes. It's Linus when his blanket is in the dryer. There's nothing to hold on to. I love this quote because I think over the last few weeks, certainly most of us have been trying to figure out where our blanket is and what we can indeed hold on to. And it's this neutral zone that's the most confusing uh, part of the uh, process. It's a great quote about, um, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot about tra trapeze artists, but my sense is this trapeze artist doesn't let go of the one trapeze hoping that the other one comes. They let go of the trapeze knowing that the other one comes. So my advice here is put your blanket in the dryer as, as infrequently as possible, and that understanding that we all need something to hold on to, and some of it's some of it for some of us is friendships and meaningful relationships. For some of us, it, it is um, uh, the physical example of something to hold on to. Stage three, as people adopt the change, they need help sustaining it. So some tips, reinforce the new normal. And actually, Tracy and I were talking about this earlier uh, when we were preparing the program. I have a colleague who doesn't say this is the new normal. She says this is the now normal. And I even think after we get through this stage of uh, what's going on now with this pandemic, there'll be a period of time where we'll be clumsy with each other. Um, we're, we're, cl we're clumsy with each other as we go through this change. And then when we come out the other side, you know, I noticed the other day I was walking through my neighborhood and I was uh, walking alone, w uh, walking and just getting some exercise. And I noticed as you approach people, they physically move away from you. And I began to wonder how long will it take for us to stop doing that? Or will that become the normal way in which we greet and see each other on the street? So highlight stories of success brought about the change. Take time to celebrate the change that you've all gone through. And then there's a simple model here that I reinforce. It's the center's model or understanding of the outcomes of leadership, which is you establish direction, you create alignment, and you maintain commitment to the long-term objectives of the organization. Right? As everybody's going through this, we know there are short-term things that people are doing, but we always have to keep our eye on, and certainly leadership has to keep our eye on the uh, prize. Uh, let's see. So new beginnings. Um, you know, Rosabeth Moss Cantor wrote a book in the late 1980s called uh, Change Masters, and she studied organizations that were organizations that were effective at change and organizations that were not effective at change. And and we all know um, that um, change is most effective when it's done with us and by us versus being done to us. And so when I think of organizations that are downsizing right now and people have been furloughed and people have been laid off and told that they'll be coming back into the organization, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how the organizations could harness the intellectual capital of those individuals and keeping them engaged and involved in the transition that the organization will go through without them. So new beginnings, and you see them there. There are some potential hurdles. And thank you for the note about slowing down a little bit. I appreciate that. Some potential hurdles. Maybe the new way really won't work out. And interestingly, um, if we could go back in a time capsule to January 1st and, and ask everyone, what do you think would be going on in the United States and all over the world on April 14th or 15th or 16th, I just don't think anyone could have imagined what we're dealing with right now.
So I think what's happening is organizations and individuals and leaders within organizations are taking shots at what's going on and trying to figure out what's the next step. I've been watching um, Governor Cuomo from New York on TV, and um, I've been amazed at his ability to be practical and, pr and apply current information in what he's doing every day and updating people what's going on in the crisis in New York. And what he's doing is trying to carve a path to the future, I think, by being realistic, optimistic in his voice, yet holding people accountable. And I think he's doing this wonderful dance of accountability and authenticity, which I think is really, really hard to do. And if you want to see it in action, you should watch him in a press conference because he presents, the I think, the entire palette of what you would want to do, real problems, real issues, real things that need to be fixed, and an opportunity to get better at that. So I give him a shout out because I think he's doing, and a number of the governors, we're lucky in North Carolina as well. Um, remember that situations often trigger memories of other beginnings. And um, we were working with a large organization and we asked them about uh, how did they feel as a result of the last reorganization. And the response was always something like, is that the reorganization of 1999, the right sizing of 2004, the reduction in force of 2007? And they listed this, this litany of reorgs that had gone on in the organization. And so this could trigger other memories of other beginnings. And when the new beginning comes, you can no longer hide in that neutral zone. And, um, and uh, as, as a colleague of mine says at the center all the time, you have to show up and be totally present. And, you know, as you walk through the hallways, as organizations make decisions going forward, uh, some of your colleagues may not be present. And as you look around, you might have this uh-oh response that um, something really has happened and something really has changed. All right. So potential challenges faced during this process. These are these five factors that I'm going to leave here for you are derailment factors in a in a 35-year research project that the center's done on executive success and executive derailment. And what's happened is we we went to organizations and individuals and asked them about people who were successful in the organization and people who were not successful in the organization and were there differences in the ways in which they showed up and the leadership behaviors they demonstrated that caused some of the participants to derail or come off track professionally and some people to stay on track. And here are the five things people consistently told us that were derailers for people whose per, uh, performance got off track. And, and the one I want to reinforce here is this idea of difficulty changing and adapting. And uh, so the rest of our time together, we're going to talk a little bit more about this idea of uh, changing and adapting. I appreciate this, uh, this uh, uh, comment about being present is difficult. And it's difficult in a lot of ways. Uh, one is um, being present at home uh, has something means something very different than it meant uh, a month ago, right? People have kids, uh, family members. Uh, they're the squeeze generation. They may have, may have parents and children living with them. So it's not as easy as it was to be totally present. And I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, some tips I gave someone I was working with coaching, how she's going to attempt to be more present for herself. And I'll talk, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So difficulty changing or adapting. Oops, sorry. So we did a research project. Uh, we have a simulation we've done for many years at the Center for Creative Leadership called the Looking Glass Experience. And what you do um, is uh, you go through an organization where you, a, a simulation where you run a company for one day. Um, and the participants run the company for one day and they're proud of what they did. And we talked to them about the decisions they made and strategy and long term and short term and how they cared for each other, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what they don't know at that time is that co come the two days later, we actually put them back into the simulation and the company has been reorganized. And when we were doing this looking glass two component, we did it as a research process to see, could we see adaptability, flexibility 
in leadership styles if we ratchet it up uh, the situation for people in a simulation. And so we gave them organizational charts where positions were moved and removed, uh, and a new organization was built, and they had two hours to prepare a presentation for the board that was coming in about the new plan. So my colleagues at that time were Paige, it was Paige Crandall at that time, uh, it's Paige Graham now, uh, who is a CCL colleague in, in Colorado, was a graduate student, and Joni Gervis, who's also one of my CCL colleagues in Colorado. And we began to watch, and so we would observe them in the second simulation to see, could we see adaptability? Could we see it physically in people? And we began to notice that there were really three layers of flexibility that people showed. Uh, one thing, emotional flexibility. And what we found here was, and you can read that, it's the ability to vary your approach with your own and others' emotions. Some people call that emotional intelligence, okay? Do you show emotional flexibility with your approach? Are you cognitively flexible, which means you use different thinking strategies and mental frameworks? Do you look at things in different ways? And you have dispositional flexibility, which is an ability to display, and I think this is Governor Cuomo, ability to display realistic optimism, seeing opportunity in the mix of change, taking appropriate action. Yesterday, I heard him speak about the curve is flattening. He said the curve is flattening, but the truth is it's still at an inappropriate level of loss. And I thought that was a wonderful way of positively stating that something was going on, but being great. And this slide will help you because one of the things you can do for yourself is you can see, seek feedback from other people about your emotional flexibility, your cognitive flexibility, and your dispositional flexibility. Now, I will tell you an interesting thing we learned when we observed people. So we observed people, did a checklist, at, uh, filled out a couple of questions about the people as we observed them, and then we had access to their data on their 360 assessment. And what we found was, interestingly, we found a positive correlation between extroversion and adaptability. Now, let me tell you what that means. It doesn't mean that extroverts are more adaptable, and it doesn't mean that introverts are not adaptable. What it taught us during this simulation and the review of the simulation was this, that during difficult times, during difficult times, organizational challenges, people want you to be visible and available. Now, while a number of us are working from home, someone mentioned it's hard to be visible and available. I was on a Zoom call the other day, and I, I ap actually have a manager who asked us all to please put on the video. And the beauty of that is we can see each other, and that's a visibility issue. Uh, you know this. You, if you're hiding behind the screen, as you all are now, and I am now too as well, if you hide behind the screen, you can probably get away with lo a lot, but I'm also not going to see any of your reactions. And even in our research of executive coaching, there is, uh, there's no significant difference between coaching somebody on Skype or Zoom than there is coaching them one-on-one -on -one in a closed room across a, a desk from each other. So what I'm saying to you is you can measure yourself on these, these cognitive, dispositional, and emotional scales, but also I would ask you to, to for yourself, Make a decision about how present, how visible, and how engaged you can be. What works for you individually? Because quite frankly, what works for one person might not work uh, for other people. So, you, you know, it's, it's a good model if it becomes a Venn diagram, and it's also a great model if it becomes a two-by-two two box. So we went for the Venn diagram. So again, this is just an idea for you to think about these three areas and seek some feedback from people about that. Now, the interesting thing is you can probably ask your kids, spouses, and partners about each of these components as well. So emotional flexibility. You demonstrate awareness. I'll give you a second to read all of those, and then I'll talk a little bit about them. So emotional flexibility. You're demonstrating awareness of your emotions and the emotions of other people. You're managing your emotions, again, emotional intelligence, and assisting others with managing their emotions. You stay engaged, don't check out. 
You positively encourage others. You maintain a balance between emotion and action. And the way I like to think about this is that you have two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. You're seeing and hearing twice the amount that you're saying. Here it says you're talking and listening, but also acting. You're balancing your expressions of uncertainty with a positive attitude, okay? And we know this. There are these polarities and tensions in all of our lives, right? Be positive during uncertainty. Do less with more. Slow down to speed up. And in all of those tensions and all of those polarities, the great leaders learn how to manage both of those. Be realistic and optimistic. All right, so that's emotional flexibility. And again, you'll have all the slides and the recording. Dispositional. Genuine and realistically optimistic about the change and communicating that optimism. Identifying what's positive about the new experience. I was in a situation uh, many years ago with an organizational change, and uh, one, of the per one of the people in the room just continued to complain about everything that wasn't working and wasn't positive. And a mutual friend turned to him and said, do you think you could be a little more negative? And uh, we were all very good friends, and we all had a good chuckle about it, but it was an awareness for him that he was seeing the glass only as half empty. Encouraging others to get on board, commend them for doing it with their contributions. Be confident that both the leader and the team can be infect effective in this new environment. And then tolerate and work through ambiguity. You know, saying it's ambiguous is one thing, but you feeling that you can work through an a this ambiguity is a whole other thing. And, and you know that the ambiguity of today, most of us don't know what the rest of the day will unfold for us, let alone a longer term view of that, okay? But that's uh, dispositional. Here's a little bit about developmental experiences, and this is what we learned from the derailment research. So you have a, you have a, a challenge, and you have your current skill set. The research indicated that there needs to be an overlap between the challenge and your current skill set. And if the challenge is too great, too great, here's the challenge, here's your current skill set, there's very little overlap. If the challenge is too great, which is what many of us are feeling today, um, you have to overplay your current skill set and overplay your weaknesses in order to make this gap a little bit smaller. And you'll see here that in some situations there's insufficient challenge. You get a promotion that looks a lot like the current job that you have, and there's a lot of overlap of your current skill set and the challenge, and that's insufficient challenge. But I put this here because I want you to know that I think we're dealing with challenges as, at an unprecedented rate, and I think we're not sure we have the skill set, the current skill set or our new skill set to get us to that new thing. There are a lot of unknowns. So unable to adapt, so how did derailed executives differ from successful ones? They were unable to develop or adapt. They had poor working relationships. They were unable to build and lead teams. And then last, they failed to meet their business objectives. And then here's successful ones. And remember, your greatest strength could become your Achilles heel if you overplay it. Because you see success there in the list of things that our successful executives do, and you see ambitious there, but you can also be too ambitious. So ambitious overplayed, where it becomes too ambitious, probably becomes a derailment factor. And willing to take risks. So in all of this, uh, we believe that there are fundamentally four skills that our future leaders must develop. And I would encourage you to think about all four of these um, as you proceed. So I wanted to talk for a minute about somebody uh, I'm currently working with and coaching who was telling me that she was struggling with the fact that everything was sort of spinning out of control for her. 
um, kids at home, spouse at home, she's at home. They only have or had one space for the two of them to work, and they never had to worry about overlap of all of that. And she was joking with me, saying that she needed a coaching session on managing conflict in her life. And we had a good laugh about it. We know each other really well. And, and so we began to talk about that whole idea of the sphere of control and the sphere of influence that you have in your life. And so if you thought of uh, an image of three concentric circles, I would put you in the middle of that as a person who controls that arena that's in the middle. And then the next circle on the outside are the things that you influence. So in the middle are the things you control. The next circle out going out are things that you influence. And then that third circle going out are things that other people influence. And so I began to talk to her about it and asked her to put in that middle circle what are some of the things she does indeed control. And then what are some of the things that she can influence? And then what are the, some of the things that are, quite frankly, out of her control? And so as we wrapped it up, I, I usually, between coaching sessions, give people some homework to work on. And I was joking with her because she, she started by telling me that she's up to her ears and her kids' homework, and she doesn't need any, any homework. So we began to talk about a couple of things, and she came up with three great ideas that I thought were fully within her control to do something about. The first one, she said that she's on a, a 30-day furlough, and she has challenged herself to walk 100 miles in those 30 days. And so she's putting on her refrigerator, you know, the number 100, and each day she will deduct from there the, the steps that she's taken and the miles that she's walked as something she can control. And there will certainly be days that weather will not allow her to go out and do that, and she might have to double up on the subsequent days. But something she can control is her physical space and what she plans to do for herself during this time of uncertainty. The second thing she said is she remembered uh, for years she had done yoga, and she said, I just don't feel like I have time for yoga anymore. And I mentioned to her that in the recent AARP magazine, it tells you a little bit about my age, there was a great story about a six-minute yoga stretch that you can do. And so I sent her the link as an opportunity to look at it. And she's now in the morning before the kids are up. She's taking literally six to ten minutes to begin her day by winding into the day and then ending her day by winding out of the day. But again, something she controls that she can do about it. And then I told her I wanted to stretch her a little more so she had to think of a third one. And she told me, that she's uh, of Italian descent, and she always regretted not learning another language. And so what she's doing now is she has added uh, the app, and this isn't a commercial for app or in, uh, any of these apps, but she's added Babbel to her phone, and 15 minutes a day, she's going to spend some time learning a new language. Now, if she can couple those things, right, if, if she can walk and listen to the language uh, podcast, good for her. But what she's doing is she's decided that for right now there is a sphere or an arena that she controls. And as someone listed on the chat, you're right, she's practicing self-care. Because in the, in the middle of all of this, the only part that she controls is what she can do for herself and what her family can do for her and she can indeed do for her family. OK, so I would encourage all of you as you think about self-awareness for yourself, right, and putting yourself back on the agenda and keeping yourself on the agenda. And I know you're listing them in the chat. Uh, breathing is a great example of mindfulness. And I, I used to think um, I have a colleague who's done yoga for 20 years, and I remembered uh, he told me about two or three years ago about closing my office door, uh, turning the light out, and for five minutes just taking some deep breaths. And you know, I'm one of those people who thought, uh, yeah, all right, who you know, who 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 really does that? And I actually find myself these days spending more time alone, and I'm being intentional about taking care of myself and slowing down me in this process. Because I can't control everything that's spinning out of control out and about and around me. I, again, my sphere of influence is what are the bits that I can control. 
So self-awareness, uh, I would encourage you to look at that middle circle of control and for yourself, jot down a thing, few things that you do indeed control or have control over. And then I told her at the next session, we'll talk about conflict and I'll talk to her a little bit about managing conflict that's now kind of emerged in her house. So self-awareness, learning agility, and that's exactly as it sounds. How flexible, how adaptable are you and do you know when to change course and others to do so and help others do so? You know, as I think about it, um, most of us, you know, are not even doing a job that we were, we knew existed when we started our careers. And what we find ourselves doing is, is having careers now that we're thinking, gosh, did I ever think I would be doing this? And, and I often say, not in my wildest dreams. And then I often reflect back on a series of decisions I made in my career that moved me in a direction of doing what I currently do today, and it was a lifetime journey. And then I thought about the different ways and levels and opportunities in which I took advantage of to learn, right? You can imagine, like I remember, you know, I remember taking a typing class in, in high school, and we used to joke about the typing class, and I think to myself, Imagine today if you thought typing was not a skill that you had to have or working on a computer today that you thought, yeah, that's just a passing fancy. I don't have to learn how to do that, right? So what's your self-awareness about yourself? What, how agile are you as a learner? Do you use a variety of media to be able to learn? And, um, and then can you multitask in doing those things in self-awareness and learning agility? Can you listen to a great podcast while you're walking? You know, and I do both. I listen to podcasts, but there are times, quite frankly, I have no earbuds in, and I just listen to the wind, the wind passing through the trees and birds and dogs barking and my neighbors yelling from their porch, hello, and I enjoy the moment and be totally present. So are you self-aware? Do you show learning agility? What do you know about yourself as an influencer? And during this time where we're all being reflective, when I coach people, I ask them to write down, again, I use three concentric circles. And in that inner core of their influence circle, I ask them to list the names of people who are their greatest influencers the people they count on most to get things done. That second layer is the next layer of influencers, and then the third layer is the third layer of influencers. And then what I ask them to do also is I ask them to write an aspirational influence map. Who's not on their, uh, on their influence map who ought to be, right? I see some of you talking about reframing from the negative to the positive makes a huge difference. That's a great example. It takes the thinking from either or to an and moment, right? And then I would also suggest, though, are you, re are you framing and reframing the right problem? I was working with someone who told me they wanted to work on their delegation skills. And when I dug deeper with them, I asked them, why, so why do you think you have to work on your delegation skills? And they said, well, there's a lot going on. And... And, and then I said, so why do you think you're not good at delegating? And he said, uh, well, I have a team that I inherited, and they wanted the other person for the job, the other candidate. So, so this person got a job that they wanted someone else to get. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. I said, so tell me more about how you plan to delegate to them. And he said, uh, well, you know, the truth is they don't like me very much, and I don't like them very much. And I don't trust them to do what I need them to do. And so my question to him about reframing was, did he really need to work on his delegation skills or did he need to work on developing an effective team? Because they're two different things. So as you reframe and talk about if you do that, what will that get you? And think of different ways of attacking your problem. Be sure you're framing the right problem. So self-awareness, learning agility, influence, and then the last one is communication. And remember, I like to remind people, as I said earlier, Martin Luther King never said, I have a strategic plan. He said, I have a dream. And so your communication has to be part substance, part strategy, and part dreaming. And it has to be a merger of all of those things. And, and remembering that 
people are judging you by your behavior. They're not judging you by your intentions. And so if you said to someone, I meant to call you, that's you telling them your intentions, but they're not judging you on that. They're judging you on the fact that you didn't call. So that should be about 45 minutes, and we wanted to leave 15 minutes to tackle a couple of things. Lots of good stuff coming up in this chat box, and I greatly appreciate all of you jumping in uh, and sharing insights. And, and for my dear, dear friends and colleagues sh shouting out and saying hello. Um, so why don't we take some questions? I don't know, Tracy, if you've captured some or... Um, I, I do have a few, Al. I know that you did, um, you're doing a great job checking the chat and sort of addressing some of them as you saw them come in. Um, uh, one question I had uh, was around uh, the development experience and um, asking about is the overlap more that uh, is better or less is better? Oh, overlap between the current skills and the future skills? Correct. You, prob you probably want about a 30%. The research indicated that you wanted about a 30% overlap of current skills and new role or new responsibility. And if you think about that, Tracy, what you would want to think about. So suppose, Tracy, I got a, an opportunity here at the center for a promotion. Some of that overlap would be the people I know, the work I already do, the kinds of experiences I've had at the center, uh, what I know about our work and our clients. So I'd already have a pretty good overlap of of because those aren't going to change when I go into that new role. It's when people change roles completely and there's no overlap, that's where it becomes the danger zone because they have to learn the job and learn new skills at the same time. Yes, um, Santiago was asking, how important is it, um, is the ability to unlearn? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, gosh. I think it's key, right? You know, it's the, the, when, we, when we talk in class sometimes, we say to people that, you know, someone told them 20 years ago they were good with a hammer, so the whole world's a nail, and all they'd keep doing is pounding that nail with this big hammer. And, and why you do leadership development or participate in webinars is because you have to put a couple of other tools in the toolbox. And quite frankly, I might have to put that hammer down and pick up another tool to work with my colleagues because maybe the hammer isn't working. And I think unlearning is key. And um, the good example of that, Tracy, too, is when, when people are learning a new language. I lived, I see some of my Brussels, old Brussels colleagues are on the, uh, on the chat as well. Um, when you're learning a new language, which they were brilliant at doing, um, they speak multiple languages every day, it's best to do that without any interference, right? So once I begin to learn a language, I almost have to unlearn my language to be able to learn the new language. And that's why adults seem to str struggle more with learning new languages than uh, children do. Thanks, Al. Um, question about uh, how often should we reassess the three circles? Uh, I would say now would be a good time, it seems people, now would be a good time to take a good look at it from your perspective. And then what I would do is I would find two or three trusted colleagues, people who know me well, and seek out some feedback from them about each of those circles. So I wouldn't tell them what I wrote about myself. I would say I'm trying to get a, a grasp on me as a, a self-aware uh, a cognitive learner trying different styles and different ways of thinking. And I'm wondering, as you experience me, again, my behavior, not my intentions, as you experience me, what observations do you have about me as a cognitive learner thinking differently uh, or being optimistic or being uh, showing emotional intelligence? Um, or uh, varying my approaches. So I wouldn't tell them what I wrote and look for verification of it. I would ask them how they would react to those three areas. And that's where I would start, me first, small circle, and then I would, I would look to expand that. And I think like anything in your life, you should regularly come back to it because my guess is you could start to write in those circles examples of things you're doing to get better at that. Right, and, and uh, I, I have a nephew who's applying for a job right now, and my first question to him was, send me your CV and I'll have a look at it. You know, send me your resume. Well, he doesn't have one. And he hasn't had one in eight or nine years because he's had a job for eight or nine years. And I think the agile learner and that person who, who is um, 
uh, able to manage the cognitive and the emotional part of that probably updates their um, CV and resume regularly, not because they're looking for a job, but because it keeps track of what they're doing. So I think what you do with these circles is once, every once in a while you glance at them and all you're doing is keeping track of what you're doing. Now, uh, Jess was asking, what are your suggestions to be more available in a predominantly digital space? Yeah, yeah. Um, all of the research is clear. Nothing replaces FaceTime, and I don't mean the app FaceTime. I mean the fact of looking at someone when you speak to them. So I would say err on the side of picking up a phone and calling someone, especially if your offices are working uh uh, virtually. Pick up, uh, pick up a phone and call someone directly and ask them how they're doing. Spend a few, to a few moments with them and then get to the business of the bi business. If you can use Sky Skype or Zoom, I think those are great options. If you're using them, is there a way in which you can make the group manageable? Because, you know, I've been on Zoom calls with 100 people and I'm not sure that's a manageable process for somebody who's trying to check in. Okay, I would say call or make a contact when you have no agenda, which is just an opportunity to um, um, make contact with them. I, I did want to answer one of the other questions I saw about how to influence upper management. I saw that was by an old friend of mine who uh, is uh, works at Purdue, um, uh, Purdue University, uh, and reinforced by someone something Margie had asked about how to influence upper management to think in this way. Well, one of the ways you can do that is you can certainly share the resources we're sharing with you with them. And as you know, what it's, it's very different to say to somebody, you know, I went to this WebEx and I think you should have been there paying attention to what they had to say versus saying to someone, I listened to this WebEx and I had a few ideas of things I'm going to try. I thought you might like to have this information as well. Right? Because as you know, it's real easy to tell people up the food chain what they should be doing. But where you start, quite frankly, is what are you doing with the people that you report to directly and work with directly? You know, are you a person who makes it easy for your direct reports to succeed? Uh, and are you a person who makes it easy for your boss or manager to succeed? Uh, but I think it always begins with you starting with saying what you learned about yourself. Thanks, Al. Um, can you give an example of cognitive flexibility? Yeah, you know, uh, the Navy used to use a technique called odd person out. And what they did was, uh, suppose Tracy, you and I were working on a project together with Regina, and we were stuck or struggling, or we felt like we came to a pretty good solution. We'd invite in somebody who knows very little about the situation and ask them what they think of our solution. And what you're showing there is that you want somebody brought in who thinks differently than you do or might have a different lens or approach to it. And it's, it's no different in an organization that does manufacturing. Uh, you know, the researchers come up with this great idea and they never bring the manufacturing people to the table to see about it being produced. Right? And so what it is is it's bringing that other voice to the table. And quite frankly, there are people who I don't want to say they have multiple voices in their head because that's a whole other issue. But what they're able to do is peel the, 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 the situation apart and just look at it and think about it in a different way. Some people use formal processes like a SWOT analysis. But the Navy used to use a process at that time they called odd man out, uh, call it odd person out. And you literally invite someone in and say to them, I'm struggling with this or we've we think we've come to a good solution. Tell me your take on it. And I think that's a person who shows cognitive flexibility and thinks differently. You, you know, Tracy, it's one thing to look at you in the meeting and say, wow, I'd never thought of that, of that as the issue or the potential solution. That's a great idea. How might we use that? That's one thing. But saying to the person, well, that's a good idea, but we don't really have time for that. Uh, one of those approaches is a much more positive approach. Thanks, Al. Um, got time for a few more questions here. Um, from Hart, is the focus during the pandemic about flexible leadership something that will continue or will we abandon this key focus going uh, forward? 
for the next yeah. crisis. Yeah, you know, I think I, I just, uh, and, and I think lots of people agree, I, I'm just not sure there will be a normal, whatever normal was, you know, three months ago for us. I don't think we'll see that for some long time. I was listening to Bill and Melinda Gates talk um, on an interview with ABC News, and he and Bill Gates believes, you know, there'll come a point where we'll reopen, whatever that means, and then there'll be a period of time where we're waiting for the vaccine and the solution. And he suggested that could be 14 or 16 more months. And so what I think is here for me, I'll t uh, talk about myself, I have to be first patient with myself and first patient, then move that out to being patient with the people who surround me and help me and support me. But it begins with me. Um, and, you know, I... Um, you know, and all of these, this, that's why I was looking, you know, I looked at the pandemic of 1918 and the flu, and I thought maybe those headlines would be appropriate today. But the truth is, every time there's been a pandemic or a major world crisis, or you can think of a number of examples, the hurricanes that have been multiplying in the Atlantic Ocean, it seems like every time it happens, we, we have to learn again what we should have learned the last time. Um, and so I'm hopeful this time because of the broad brushstroke, uh, because it's literally touched everywhere in the world now, that maybe that brushstroke of what the future ought to look like might be a little bit more um, permanent marker than dry erase marker. Now, um, how much dispositional flexibility is helpful or plays significant role in the tasks which are time-bound and, and hard targets? Yeah, the, uh, dispositional flexibility is about realism, right? Um, and what we're all, I think, the realistic part of going forward, I think, for all of us is going to be people are going to ask, you imagine, you know, when we get back to getting back to what we need to get back to, the expectations of volume of work are going to grow exponentially. And so I think what people have to know during that uh, to be dispositional in that uh, time is that it is realistic for people to ask more of you because of what has happened to slow the business or the industry down. And so as we move into that, I think we can expect, we can expect that everybody's expectations are going to go up and what the day of work will look like will probably be a bit different because we're going to have to play a whole bunch of catch up. And I think that's every industry you can imagine. Included in that would be that organizations who have lost really talented people who won't come back, you have to replace that, um, that resource. Al, is it imperative for a person to have three adaptabilities to engender flexible leadership in the contemporary world? No, I would think if you do any one of these really well, uh, we, we saw some themes and patterns emerging when we observed people, so we ro rolled them into these three ideas. But my sense would be if you do any one of these really well, any one of them really well, I think you're well on your way to being flexible and adaptable. I mean, if all you did was think differently cognitively about the ways in which problems are solved, or all you did was varied your approach of working with individuals, or all you did was... Uh, were realistic and optimistic, and you learn to balance that tension, I think you'd be well on your way. And last question I think we have time for. Um, how do you keep stability in your organization as a leader during these critical times? Communicate, communicate, communicate. And um, I think you can, if, if you thought you told them that last week, you might want to remind them this week. And remember that during times of change and in difficult situations, people expect people to be visible and available. And so when I coached people, I, I was coaching somebody who worked in a mattress factory, and I told him that during this difficult time or his difficult transition, he needed to be out and about. He needed to be eating, or, and this was, certainly wasn't the, during the pandemic, but he needed to be visibly available to the people that he's working with. And that included, because they were, the offices were not shut down at that time, they were just downsizing a bit. Uh, he needed to be out and about, physically available, eating lunch in the cafeteria and spending time on the shop floor. 
Great. Well, we have reached the end of our time. Thank you, Al, for sharing the benefits of flexible leadership and providing ideas for our audience to foster it in their organizations to stay agile and competitive. Everyone who attended the webinar today will receive a follow-up email by Monday with links to the webinar recording and our white paper, Adaptable Leadership, What It Takes to Be a Quick Change Artist. We'll also have several other complimentary resources that we'll send. Um, the paper is also available to download now from your webinar resources. As you exit the webinar, we hope you'll take a moment to complete the evaluation so we can continue to make these webinar events well worth your time. Thank you again, Al, and our audience, Tracy, we look forward to your yeah. attendance in a future webinar. I, I just wanted to, I did want to thank everybody. I know this is an incredibly challenging, difficult time, and I think I really want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for spending an hour with us trying to figure some of this out. Uh, stay safe and best wishes to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Regina. Thank you. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. We will send all registrants an email with a link to the recording, and have a great day. Thank you.